Act One of Keep Your Own Secret by Pedro Calderon de la Barca. Translated by Henry Richard Vassal Holland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dramatis Personae Alexander Farnese, Prince of Parma, read by Nathaniel Adkins. Don Caesar, his secretary, read by Krista Zaleski. Don Arius, read by Greg Giordano. Don Felix de Castelois, read by Adrian Stevens. Lazaro, Don Caesar's servant, read by Alan Mapstone. Donna Anna de Casteloy, sister of Don Felix, read by Lindsay Clark. Elvira, Donna Anna's maid, read by Sonia. Musician, read by Todd. Stage directions, read by Larry Wilson. Scene, Parma. Keep your own secret. Act One. An apartment in the Prince's Palace. Enter the Prince and Don Arius. I saw her alight from her carriage, Don Arius. She came to visit my sister, and though her beauty was always incomparable, yet then, methought, new graces played around her, and her eyes sparkled with redoubled luster. I gazed on her till, like one who has too long looked upon the sun, my sight was dazzled with the view, and almost lost the power of distinguishing inferior objects. Nay, and thought she is present to me still. Imagination busily retraces every feature, and places before me her bright image. I know not, Don Arius, whether it be love with which she has inspired me. And yet much I fear that these symptoms can denote no other disease. But had you never seen Dornia Anna before? Several times. Then what to-day? can have effected such a change in your sentiments towards her that is a question which sounds like a very wise one and yet it shows but little knowledge of human nature do not our sentiments on every subject undergo changes equally sudden do we not often love to-day that which we hated yesterday and adore that which we shall detest to-morrow and yet be unable to assign any adequate reason everything earthly is in its own nature mutable and no variation ought to surprise a man who rightly considers the objects which surround him i know not why i had never before beheld her with so much admiration perhaps i was this morning less blind than usual or she looked more charming but be that as it may i am determined henceforward to devote myself to her service and i will entrust the secret of my passion to no one but yourself your highness does me infinite honor by reposing such a confidence in me yet i must own that there are two circumstances which appear to me very extraordinary one is to hear you talk so tenderly of love do you suppose then that princes are formed in different moulds from other men and are exempted from the passions attendant on human nature they ought not indeed to be too easily led away by their inclinations nor should the great and important cares which occupy their minds leave room for the intrusion of every idle fancy yet believe me the greatest hero need esteem it no dishonour to have been once in his life susceptible of love i think it was the saying of some philosopher i would neither have a man so stupid as never to have been in love at all nor so mad as to fall in love a second time well sir i am ready to pay all due deference to the reasonableness of your passion but still allow me to confess to you the other subject of my surprise it is that i should be the person to whom you deign to entrust the secret don cesar your secretary is my most intimate friend and i cannot but fancy i encroach upon his privileges if i accept the confidence which appears to be more justly due to him call him sir and acquaint him with your love 
you well know how worthy he is to be admitted to a participation in every affair in which your interests are concerned and the more highly i esteem the honour which you would confer on me the less am i inclined to supplant him in your favour or to profit by the loss which my friend might sustain if you are caesar's friend don arius i do him no injury by honouring you my regard for him is the same as it has always been our attachment to each other began when we were boys and since he has been with me as my secretary my heart has ever hitherto been open to him on all subjects as to the man on whose fidelity and discretion i could the most implicitly rely but for this little while past i know not what the devil has ailed him he has paid no attention to the duties of his office he has neglected the most important dispatches when i have spoken to him he has stood as if he was stupefied or given me some answer wholly foreign to the purpose and when he has begun to say anything to me he has stopped short in the middle of a sentence and left me to guess what the end of it was to be it is this strange alteration in himself which has interrupted my intimacy with him but as i know you are more in his confidence than anybody else i wish you would try both for my sake and his own to discover what it is which has thus strangely disordered him if he has any secret cause of discontent you may tell him that everything i possess is at his disposal that my principality itself is subject to him that in short my only motive for wishing to be acquainted with the occasion of his trouble is that i may be enabled either to redress it or to share it with him this generosity is worthy of yourself and of the illustrious name you bear enter lazaro i can't find my master high nor low but that's just like my usual fortune if i had any bad news for him now i should meet with him directly and get a box on the ears for my reward but as i am carrying him a letter which i know will gain me a purse of gold i may lay my account in not overtaking him all day i'll search every place however if i answer whom have we here ah yonder's the prince i must hide my letter and mum do you know what fellow that is don arius he is don cesar's servant i suppose he came this way by chance and now he sees your highness he is about to retire call him hither who knows but that we may be able to collect from him the cause of his master's melancholy very probably here lazaro do you want me his highness calls you come hither friend oh sir your highness does me too much honour i am sure sir if i may be allowed the felicity of kissing your highness's feet i shall kiss nothing but shoe leather for this month to come in remembrance of my good fortune i may bolt to come hither sir i hope tis no offence to your highness to look for don caesar you find sir he is a droll fellow art thou don caesar's servant sir i am proud to say such is my quality in virtue of which i may be entitled to consider myself as the third greatest man in this principality and how canst thou make that out why sir don caesar is your highness's friend and counsellor and i am don caesar's so we three form a triumvirate and govern the state alexander caesar and i i know thee now and understand thy character that's as much as to give me license to depart how so 
because if your highness knows me you must know that i am not worth the keeping and therefore the sooner you get rid of me the better i like thy humour well enough for a time but i am soon wearied of jests to which there is no intermission for he who is always playing the fool is unfit for anything serious i meant to have inquired of thee the cause of don caesar's melancholy which i have for some time observed with infinite concern i thought it possible that thou mightest have been able to explain it to me but it is not likely he should have entrusted any secret to a buffoon like thee why sir your highness is much in the right as to the matter of that if you think don caesar a man of sense to suppose that he would have more wit than to choose a fool like me for his confidant and yet sir since it is the duty of all good servants to tell their master's secrets i must say i believe i partly know what it is that makes him so sad and mopish sir there is a game at parma that is played at by all the people of condition and this game i hope no offence to your highness is called the game of ombre now sir as ill luck would have it don caesar learned this game and one evening as he was playing though he had in his hand spadilla manilla and basto he lost the vole upon this the whole company was in amaze and nothing else was talked of till the party broke up and some said he had played right and some said he had played wrong at last my master went home but he had taken the matter so much to heart that in the middle of the night up he started and wakened me out of a fine sleep to make me bring him the cards so there he sat in his shirt shuffling and dealing and talking to himself in the greatest passion that ever you heard if i had not taken that trick says he i should have lost my queen says he and if anybody dares say anything to the contrary let him take my hand and play it himself says he and so sir ever since that night my master has been melancholy i am obliged to thee for telling me so much for i well deserve such a punishment for my folly in listening to thee i am glad thy knowledge of thy master's affairs is so confined for i should have been mortified by learning even what i the most earnestly wished to know from a person whom don caesar could not have trusted without lowering himself in my esteem go thou art a good buffoon but thy capacity extends to nothing higher oh, i am glad your highness thinks me good in any way we may all live and learn and i hope another time your highness may find me more discreet i humbly wish your highness a good day aside my buffoonery has stood me in good stead however since it has helped to excuse me from betraying my master's secret exit that fellow would amuse me if i were more in a humour to listen to him he is always such as you have now seen him i do not believe he ever knew what it was to be sad then must he necessarily be a fool for in knowing how properly to feel the calamities of life consists the very soul of wisdom he was born with this humour did you never hear of the ridiculous stories which are told of him it never fell in my way to hear anything about him i was particularly diverted lately with one of his adventures in which i had some concern myself what was that the rascal is a great gambler and one day for want of better entertainment i sat down to play with him he had no money so when he lost he was forced to pledge his goods and at last i won his sword i would not immediately return it because i had a mind to see what he would do without it upon which away he went 
inviting somewhere an old hilt, he very ingeniously fastened a lathe of wood to it, and stuck it into his scabbard, and to this hour he wears no other weapon. One might take occasion from this to play him an amusing trick, but, alas, the passion which distracts my mind leaves it little at leisure to attend to such idle jests. Go to Don Caesar, and discourse with him as I have directed you. I will repair to my sister's apartment, for there I shall find Donna Anna, and if I must languish and consume away while I am absent from her, I may surely brave the danger which awaits me from the scorching beams of her eyes. Excellent. Don Caesar's Apartment. Enter Don Caesar and Lazaro. I thought I should never have found you, sir, to give you this letter. I had it from Elvira. Is it long since you received it? I have had it in my pocket this hour or two, and I have been all over the town to hunt for you. I even went into the prince's apartment in hope I might find you there. Why, nobody can have access to the prince's apartment but with my leave. I had access without it, however, and his highness delayed me ever so much longer. You might surely have found me sooner. Ah, sir, you know I was always an unlucky dog. I never in my life found anything I looked for. But here's the letter, sir, and remember, if it brings you any good news, it is but fair you should pay the porter. Gives the letter. Oh, heavens! Shall I find it to contain my happiness or my misery? Now, sir, that's for all the world like a man who, while the clock is striking, will come up to you in a mighty hurry and ask you what the hour is. If he would be at the pains to count, he might know it without troubling his neighbour. And you, sir, if ever you learn to spell, will find that to open your letter and read it will be as ready a way as any to come at its contents. The sight of her handwriting makes a coward of me. Opening the letter. Yet why were you so long in bringing it to me? Reads. Nay, you may easily revenge yourself for that. Do you be as long in giving me my reward? I can wait a couple of hours for it very patiently. Lazaro, my new Florence suit is yours. Thank you, sir, thank you. That's very handsome pay indeed. Oh, Lazaro, my happiness has almost turned my head. Donna Anna writes to me in a style of the strongest affection and tenderness. Was ever a man so fortunate? How have I deserved such felicity? Could I tear open my breast? This precious letter should be laid upon my heart. Dear, dear paper, where shall I find a place worthy to contain such a treasure? Why, sir, if that embarrasses you, I think you had better keep it to new sole your shoes. You can't imagine what excellent things love letters are for such a purpose. I have received as many in my time as the best of them, and I never thought of turning them to any other use. But, sir, I have been thinking that, to be sure, your Florence suit will become me mightily. But then... Don't you think that such a fine gentleman will look rather silly without any money in his pocket? Make what demands thou wilt, Lazaro. I promise to give thee everything thou shalt ask of me in the course of this whole day. I accept nothing but my sword, and that I cannot part with, because I had it from a friend. Lazaro aside. Why, how the devil should he know that mine is nothing but a lap? and yet to be sure he must have found it out or else he would never have thought of accepting his sword when he is so ready to part with all besides enter don arias don cesar i am come to have some serious conversation with you your visits always give me pleasure but on what particular subject are you come to be thus serious in the first place i must tell you 
that I am commissioned by the prince to talk with you. But I must add that, even though he had not enjoined me such a task, I should have been inclined, on my own account, to make you those reproaches, which, after we have been united by so strict a friendship, any breach of the confidence which ought mutually to subsist between us may so justly demand. I am at a loss what to expect from such a prelude, Don Arius. What are the prince's commands with me, and what reproaches can I have merited from you? As a loyal subject, I will first tell you the prince's message. He says that he has long observed with concern the deep melancholy which has so visibly oppressed you, that his wish to relieve you from it renders him anxious to learn its cause, and that if a share, even in his power or greatness, can be of any avail to remove it, you may consider his authority in the state as delegated to yourself. Thus far the noble Alexander, but now suffer me to say further, that, when he inquired of me the subject of your uneasiness, I felt myself wounded in the tenderest part by the consciousness that you had not deemed me so far deserving of your confidence as to declare it to me. Have you so long called me your friend, Don Cesar, and can you refuse me the dearest privileges of friendship? I cannot indeed make you such magnificent offers as our master does. I can give you nothing in return for the trust which I solicit you to place in me, but a continuance of my faithful attachment to you. Yet that will not appear despicable to you if you compare the permanence of a friendship between equals with the instability of the favor of princes, a subject which you ought at present particularly to consider. For I can assure you that Alexander is very seriously displeased at some inattentions of which you have lately been guilty towards him, and that, be your discontent founded on what ground it may, discretion requires you to take more pains to conceal it, and at least to assume the appearance of greater cheerfulness. I offer you this counsel, Don Cesar, as your friend. I even conjure you to follow it, as you value your nearest interests. I humbly thank His Highness for his condescension in taking so great an interest in my troubles, and I thank you too, Don Arius, for your friendly solicitations and advice, and that I might return a suitable answer to both. I must request you to tell the princely Alexander that I pray heaven to prolong his life to the utmost bounds of mortality, that my sadness has not proceeded from any abatement of my zeal for his service or of my attachment to his person, that I cannot indeed assign any certain cause for the melancholy which has of late oppressed my spirits, though I too sensibly feel its effects, but that perhaps it may be ascribed to my too intense application to study, to which I have for some time past devoted more hours than my health should have permitted. This will suffice as a reply to him. But now to you, Don Arius, that you may be convinced how gratefully I feel the expressions of your friendship, I will open my whole heart. You need not, however, return too many thanks for the confidence I place in you, for indeed you are come at a moment when I am so enraptured with my own happiness that I could scarcely refrain from talking of it even to a stranger. Oh, Don Arius, be not surprised at my present transports, any more than at the deep despair to which you have lately seen me reduced. Love is made up of extremes. And has love, then, been the source of your trouble? I have now for two years adored the fairest of her sex, nor till to-day have my faithful services been able to obtain the slightest encouragement, on which to ground the most distant hope. You cannot therefore wonder that, secretly consumed by a passion which has become every day more violent, I have found it impossible so far to dissemble, but that the anguish of my mind has too visibly shewn itself in my countenance. But this morning, nay, this very hour, you see I can conceal nothing from you. I have received a letter, which has restored me from death to life, which has more than recompensed me for all my past sufferings. Words indeed fail me when I try to express to you the joy with which it has inspired me. But when you shall hear who she is, I know not whether I ought to tell you. Yet how can it be improper when I count her as my bride? But consider, Don Arius, 
if I discover her name to you, it must be under the strictest bonds of secrecy, for I am not one of those who think nothing of publishing such matters. I know the respect which is due to the honour of a woman, and how easily her reputation may be blemished by the mere mention of an affair like this. I give you the strongest proof of my reliance on your discretion, by speaking to you thus freely on a subject which I would not for the world should go any farther. You perceive, indeed, my anxiety to conceal it even from the prince. You wrong me, Don Cesar, by such repeated injunctions to secrecy. I should have hoped you knew me better than to think them necessary. I know they are superfluous, Don Arius, and I will tell you all. Donna Anna de Castioli, you will allow I could have named no lady of equal beauty or accomplishments. It is she who has so far estranged me from myself that I am incapable even of a thought of which she is not the object. I love her. No language can say how much. From your own acquaintance with her merit, however, you may form some judgment of the passion with which it has inspired me, and of the ecstasies into which her letter has thrown me. Nay, you shall see the letter, for, since I have told you so much, I need not withhold from you that mark of my confidence. I cannot indeed now wonder at your transports. Here, read it, and then you will perceive whether I have said too much. Gives the letter. I thank you. Reads. To confess that I am convinced of your attachment to me is in some measure to return it, for a woman confers a favor when she acknowledges herself to have received one. Some favors are but flattering and delusive, yet do not consider as such any which you shall receive from me, for love himself is witness of the sincerity of my regard for you, and if I offended him in any degree by so long concealing it, let him be satisfied with having at least reduced me to the shame of declaring it. Come this evening to my window, and I will tell you yet more than I have dared to write. Adieu, dear friend. May heaven preserve you. Indeed, Don Cesar, you are a fortunate man. I knew you would think me so, Don Arius. But now, were it not better you should carry my answer to the prince? When you shall have made my excuses to him, I will wait on him myself. You may be assured I shall do all in my power to serve you. Oh, thy bright luminary of day! Thou who so often hast thyself confessed the power of love, hasten thy course towards the western hemisphere, and shorten the hours which yet must intervene before I may visit my adored Donna Anna. So may no future Daphne disappoint thy pursuit. Excellent Don Caesar and Lazaro. So, here am I in possession of two secrets. Let me consider what I am to do with them, and whether my prince or my friend has the strongest claims upon me. A plague take all the prying fools, say I, that want to dive into their neighbor's concerns. If I acquaint Cesar with the prince's love, I fill his mind with jealousy, and jealousy is an evil present to make to a good friend. If, on the other hand, I tell the prince that Cesar is his rival, I violate the confidence which Cesar has reposed in me. If I keep the secrets of both, in some degree I betray them both, and must listen to each with a dissimulation scarcely consistent with my honor. The prince's passion is but of today. However violent it may be, it cannot as yet have taken any deep root in his heart. Cesar has long been very dear to him. Perhaps if I tell him that Cesar is the accepted lover of Doña Ana, and if I exaggerate the encouragement she gives him, so timely a discovery may induce the noble Alexander to resign his own pretensions to a mistress who is so liberal of her favors to his rival. By making such a use as this of the secret with which my friend has trusted me, I may then render him the most essential service. I cannot entirely reconcile in my own conscience this plan nor indeed any other. This affair has confused all my senses. I will serve my friend, however, if I can, and if I injure him, at least my intentions are good. Exit. The palace. Enter the prince, Don Felix, Dona Anna, 
and attendants. Indeed, you must permit me. Positively, your highness must come no farther, or I cannot proceed. I insist upon attending you to the door. I entreat your highness not to think of it, for it would be conferring too great an honour upon me. You should rather consider it as a, a duty incumbent upon me. The higher my rank, the greater degree of politeness is required of me, especially towards a lady of your family and merit. It is universally known that you excel all other princes, no less in courtesy than in arms, and in the nobler qualities of the mind. But I earnestly beg that you will not now pass any further, since the more highly I respect you, the more should I be overwhelmed with confusion at receiving a mark of distinction of which I am so unworthy. You must permit me to contradict you, when you speak thus slightingly of your own perfections. I will not, however, lose an opportunity of convincing you of my unbounded submission to you on every subject, by obeying your commands, and denying myself the pleasure of attending you. Perhaps, indeed, I should expose myself to a danger too great if I trusted myself any longer in the presence of such irresistible charms. Adieu, madam. I humbly take my leave of your highness. Exit. Don Felix, do not you escort your sister? I only stay to express to your highness how deeply I am penetrated with the honour which you confer us both, and to assure you of my gratitude and of my fervent prayers to heaven for your life and prosperity. I thank you for your good wishes, but do not delay at present. Your sister is by herself. Follow and attend her, as well in my name as your own. Exit Don Felix. Can anything be more provoking than to receive praises from her lips while her eyes deny me a single responsive glance? Enter Don Arius. Well, Don Arius, what news? Have you met with Caesar? I have both seen him and discoursed with him. But before I tell your highness what has passed between us, may I not request to know the progress of your love? Why, really, I can scarcely tell you whether it is Caesar or Donna Anna who occasions me the greatest disquietude. Ever since you left me, I have been with my sister and her ladies, among whom Donna Anna bloomed like the rose amidst the meaner flowers. My eyes were riveted to her face, nor were my ears less occupied by her discourse, for the charms of her wit are not inferior to those of her person. The evening passed but too quickly away, and when she rose to depart, I escorted her as far as this apartment. She would not permit me to attend her any farther. This is all which is hitherto past, so that I have no better account of myself to give you than that I am dying of love, and know not how to submit to the pains of absence. And would it then be impossible to persuade you to relinquish this passion? I will not absolutely say that. A love of so recent a date might possibly enough be stifled, if it should be opposed by any considerations of greater moment. So, at least, I am willing to flatter myself. Then it is not too late for the disclosure which I have to make to you. Sir, if you love Don Cesar, withdraw your affections from Doña Ana. Let it suffice to tell you that your pretensions to her will prove injurious to his dearest interests. Ha! What am I to understand by this? Your Highness looks displeased. Perhaps I have already said too much. Don Arias, when you begin to impart anything to a person who has not asked it of you, you lay yourself under an obligation to complete the discovery. Either acquaint me with every circumstance to which your words allude, or it were better you had hinted nothing. Am I to infer from what you have said that Caesar is in love with Donna Anna? Be it so. Caesar is my friend and rather than oppose his inclinations, I am capable of putting a force upon my own. Proceed, then. Of what are you afraid? Of violating, by my indiscretion, the faith due to the secret of a friend. If it was your duty to conceal it, why did you tell me anything about it? It is my wish to afford your highness satisfaction. 
aside pardon me cesar if i betray thy confidence to tell the whole truth then sir a mutual attachment subsists between them how does donna anna i shall lose my senses is she acquainted with don caesar's passion she returns it with tenderness prince aside this is more than i can bear had i but heard that caesar loved her i could have pitied in my friend those pains which i myself endured i could have given her up and permitted him to urge his suit but to behold in him a favoured rival to learn it thus suddenly before i had time to prepare my mind for such a blow i could have vanquished my love but i cannot suppress my jealousy don arius aside now if i exaggerate the favours which she bestows on don cesar the prince who already seemed so angry will certainly be sufficiently provoked to renounce her for ever prince aside but let me restrain this emotion is their love then indeed reciprocal i have myself just seen the strongest assurances of her affection prince aside my vexation is too great to be repressed in a letter which don cesar has this morning received from her prince aside a letter distraction yet if i already know that she loves him why should a letter give me any additional pain would i had continued ignorant at least of this but who while he endured such anguish could have had patience to forbear further enquiries when the most fatal certainty can scarcely equal the torment of suspense what was the subject of her letter to invite him to her window at night here where she has promised to see and to converse with him prince aside will she converse with him while i am doomed to silence shall they be interchanging vows of love while i am a prey to all the torments of a hopeless passion but can it then be possible that jealousy has so much more power over me than love a few moments since i fancied myself able to resign her to my friend yet if for his sake i forbear to indulge my own desires at least i will allow myself the poor satisfaction of interrupting the pleasure which he expects in this promised interview he shall not spend this night so much more happily than his prince don arius does caesar know anything of my love for donna anna how can he if you have confided it to no other than myself to none but thee did caesar perhaps confide his passion and yet am i acquainted with it a fault committed with a good intention may surely claim some excuse well then don arius since you have already done so much for my satisfaction i must require of you now a little more you will comprehend that what you have told me has quite put an end to my love so that it is only curiosity which at present actuates me an impertinent curiosity perhaps it may be but yet since i am thrown out of the game myself i would still methinks be a distant looker-on you shall tell me faithfully everything that passes between don caesar and donna anna but if you condemn me sir for the breach of confidence of which i have already been guilty how can i venture on a second the first was voluntary i shall give you a sufficient excuse for all the future disclosures you may make to me by demanding them of you you shall tell me no more than i ask ah sir i say it shall be so i am unquestionably bound to obey you yet consider my commands are absolute to what difficulties does he expose himself who cannot keep a secret yet where shall he be found who can enter don caesar and lazaro oh that it were night so it will at its own proper time and season and never a bit the sooner invoke the sun moon and stars as you will but see 
the prince his looks give me no encouragement however i must accost him advancing although sir i am conscious that i have late afforded your highness but too just cause for displeasure yet since don arius promised to attempt my excuse i presume to hope that you will pardon these apparent negligences of which i may have been guilty and ascribe them not to any culpable intention but solely to the involuntary depression of spirits under which i have for some time laboured though i cannot ascribe it to any certain cause i assure you caesar don arius has so faithfully represented to me the dejected state of your mind that i feel for your sufferings as if they were my own and indeed i think i understand the cause of your sadness better than you do yourself you want some amusement which may a little dissipate your thoughts and therefore i intend to take you abroad with me to-night we will disguise ourselves and make the round of the city we will visit all the places of diversion and see what music play and pretty women can do to drive away your cares for believe me caesar i love you so well that i would give my principality to see you as cheerful as you used to be your highness does me infinite honour but i assure you my melancholy is already so totally removed by those marks of your kindness which i have to-day had the good fortune to experience that i never in my life felt myself more cheerful and contented than i do at this moment i therefore entreat your highness not to give yourself any trouble to procure me amusement for i cannot spend this night in any manner so satisfactory to myself as in retiring to meditate in private on my happiness nor could anything be so likely to replunge me into my former state of mind as to see you sir disturbed for my sake from your other occupations i tell thee caesar i have suffered too much uneasiness on thy account to be so easily satisfied and unless i have thee under my eyes this whole night that i may myself be witness to this happy change in thy humour i shall fancy i know not what and all thy melancholy will be transferred to me lazaro sir thou too shalt be of our party very readily sir and let your highness consider me as a man on whom you may rely i pray heaven your highness may be exposed to some notable danger or perplexity on purpose to give me an opportunity of showing what i can do are you so valiant then why to be sure and please your highness it does not become a man to praise himself and yet while i wear this sword by my side i should scorn to yield to any one breathing is your blade a good one lazaro aside there he has me i won't presume to say sir but that your highnesses may be better however my answer's well enough for my occasions oh i perceive you speak modestly does it cut well wonderfully if i were to strike with it even upon a steel buckler at the very first blow you should see the splinters fly into the air aside and well they might but they would be its own splinters is it finely tempered oh yes it has a very good temper it is not bloody-minded you have raised my curiosity to see so superlative a weapon draw it lazaro aside how shall i come off now don caesar aside ah oh, me my unhappy fate i'm sorry sir to disobey your highness's commands but to say the truth i have bound myself by a solemn vow never to draw it but upon occasion of serious service let your highness but call for its aid against your enemies and you shall see but i will not tell you what you shall see my sword shall speak for itself don caesar aside was ever man so vexatiously circumstanced i shall go distracted sir indeed it is quite unnecessary that you should take any trouble to dissipate my sadness 
my cheerfulness may convince you how perfectly my mind is at ease you may deceive yourself caesar but you cannot me i can still perceive that your spirits are oppressed and your countenance too plainly expresses a mind brooding over some inward trouble you must positively go with me for all your subjects of uneasiness are mine also and the diversions in which i propose to engage will prove a relief to me no less than to yourself exit who would not die of grief to lose in this unexpected manner the happiness for which he had so long and anxiously sighed for which perhaps no other opportunity may ever be offered don arius aside heaven knows how sincerely it was my wish to serve him but he must not discover how far my indiscretion has contributed to his present vexation why will not you entrust the prince with your secret don cesar you see he has only proposed this unlucky scheme with a view to relieve your melancholy and he surely would not persist in requiring your attendance to-night if he knew how injurious it would prove to your dearest interests exit lazaro sir what will donna anna say of me she may say anything she pleases what will she do stand all night at the window most likely in a cursed bad humour she will say that all my love has been dissembled and offended beyond every hope of pardon that heart now so favourably disposed towards me will learn to think of me with abhorrence or perhaps consign me to eternal oblivion ah oh, wretch wretch who could have expected that things would have gone so cross methinks the knight need not have been in such a hurry to obey your invocations if this were all the luck it was to bring you i am too much vexed to attend to thy fooleries very lightly sir but yet wise as you are it would do you no harm if you would take the word of a fool that let your present vexation come from what quarter it may it is nothing worse than may always be looked for by the man who can't keep his own secret excellent end of act one act two of keep your own secret by pedro Calderon de la barca translated by henry richard vassal holland this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two, The Street, Night. Enter the Prince, Don Arias, Don Felix, Don Caesar, and Lazaro. It is a very fine night. The stars shine so brightly that one might suppose the sun himself had been broken into pieces and scattered about the heavens while the moon encircled with silvery clouds darts on us her trembling beams which emulate the light of day ay there she sails along as round as a wafer mary she's no empty moon to-night but full filled up to the very brim don caesar aside ah me methinks i scarcely feel the mere disappointment of my hopes so much more deeply am i grieved to think how just a cause donna anna will have to reproach me to question the sincerity of my affection sir the night grows cold is it not better to retire the dew may prove injurious to your health and we have already strolled long enough you know my rank will not permit me to walk about the streets in the daytime, and therefore, since I am out to-night, I am determined not to go home till I have seen every corner of the city. Don Caesar aside. Distraction! But my emotion will betray me. Let me try to join in the conversation of the rest. Oh, could I but for a moment divert my mind from these torturing reflections! What think you, sir, of Flora? is not that the milanese lady she looks well enough at a distance very true 
especially if it be at a distance so great that she can't be seen at all i think laura dresses very well and very well she may for she has a pawnbroker for her lover and he gives her the choice of all the goods in his shop don caesar aside at this very moment methinks i see donna anna standing at her window and saying to herself what can this mean the hour is past but caesar appears not is it thus he values my favours and then she will be angry but i forget that i had resolved to turn my thoughts to other subjects celia sung extremely well Aye, you seldom find so good a voice joined with so bad a face nature was willing to give her some accomplishment to compensate for her want of beauty as i have heard that in some countries they give good portions to the ugly girls and none to the pretty ones what think you of lucinda who lately bethought herself that instead of spending her money in house rent she would lay it out upon a coach and when somebody asked her where she meant to live she replied in the coach all day and at night in the coach house don caesar aside i cannot attend these idle discourses let me make one more attempt sir the night is far advanced and the princess your sister will be anxious for your return you know her affection for you and her constant solicitude about you do not occasion her this uneasiness prince aside i am much more concerned at observing your uneasiness what says your highness i say that i need not hasten my return on that account for my sister does not know that i am out of the palace don caesar aside that hope has failed me in this little hovel there live two women so hardened in evil courses that you might defy the most eloquent preacher in italy to persuade them to walk uprightly why so because one of them is crooked and the other humpbacked here lives an old woman who passes for a witch bid her avaunt then in the devil's name oh you need not be afraid of her they say her magic goes no farther than love potions so much the worst i once learnt to my cost what it was to deal with vermin of that stamp why what harm did they do you sir you must know that i fell in love once upon a time when i had better have left it alone and nothing would serve me but i must go to a witch for a charm to help forward my suit she told me she could do nothing unless i fetched her a lock of my mistress's hair away i went to lie in wait for the prize and at last as luck would have it i found my nymph one day asleep and cut off a fine flowing curl that shaded her forehead upon that my sorceress founded her charm and promised that at midnight i should see the owner of it come to my bed's foot and draw my curtain but little did i suspect what sort of visitor i was to have instead of the lady i looked for fair and blooming as the morn in stalked to claim the curl a skeleton for alas my charmer had worn a periwig my hair stands on end at this moment when i think of the fright i was in however it had one good effect it cured me of my love don caesar aside of what avail are all my endeavours to banish her from my recollection if the pains of love are capable of surviving even the loss of reason and of memory again but how idle are the dreams of a lover again i can fancy i behold donna anna 
not that she retains any wish to see me but only to convince herself the more certainly of my perfidy returning once more to her window and there not finding me she exclaims methinks i hear her though caesar should come now it would be too late the affection is extinguished which would have led me to receive him my anna my only love consider but i rave has any one noticed me no alas i imagined myself talking with her prince aside to don arius don arius caesar conceals his trouble very ill don arius aside to the prince his emotions overpower him prince aside to don arius he has missed his opportunity however nor need he complain since i am silent who have not gained it he may surely submit to the torments of absence if i can endure with patience those of jealousy don arius aside to the prince consider sir dona anna's brother is present take care lest he overhear what you say prince aside to don arius there is no danger he is of too noble a nature to be open to suspicion musician singing within from fair anada forced to part alexis mourned with throbbing heart ah hapless swain at once to prove the pains of absence and of love a fine voice excellent the voice the air the instrument and the words are admirably suited to each other prince aside to don arius don arius this will be a good opportunity to see how lazaro will come off with his wooden sword how do you mean to try that sir you shall see lazaro sir i am about to give you a proof of the confidence i place in you every night when i walk abroad i hear yonder fellow singing and i am offended that he should choose this street for his music i will go then sir as discreetly as i may and tell him that it is your highness pleasure he should sing elsewhere that will not answer my purpose lazaro aside it would answer mine though how the devil shall i come off if he sends me to pick a quarrel with him no punishment can be too severe for the man who has thus offended my ears uh, what must i do then sir draw your sword to be sure and run him through the body without any further ceremony oh sir i can't indeed as a man of honour attack a paltry fiddler at such a disadvantage consider he is alone and i have all this great company on my side you had better let me defer till to-morrow morning and then i'll set out by myself to seek him and be sure to bring your highness his head yet methinks the poor fellow is very innocent of any evil intentions and truly you ought in conscience to let him know that you don't like his music before you proceed to these violent means of putting an end to it do as i bid you or i shall believe you make these excuses out of cowardice lazaro why don't you obey his highness's orders will you permit me sir to punish the musician or me well i see it must be so but i trust heaven will defend the cause of the innocent enter the musician who passes across the stage musician sings his voice by grief a while repressed at last his sorrows thus expressed ah me forlorn at once to prove the pains of absence and of love now then caitiff i advance to murder thee yet if thy guilt be no greater than i suppose it 
i invoke all the saints to change this my blade of well-tempered steel into a dull and edgeless piece of wood that so it may lose all power to harm thee draws his sword a miracle a miracle an admirable trick now sir you see how evidently this man's innocence is proved by so miraculous an interposition in his favour sir i make your highness a present of this wonderful sword for you alone are worthy to possess so great a rarity and inestimable as it is i ask nothing of you in return but that you will be pleased to give me another to wear in its stead that i readily promise you which way shall we go now let us return towards the palace that his highness may retire to rest there is time enough for that yet but sir the day is beginning to break and if it be what harm will that do us how do you feel yourself perfectly well sir and in very high spirits i think mine too are lighter than when we first came out may they always continue equally good sir as for me i swear to your highness you shall never see me melancholy again i am glad our night's ramble has been of so much service to us both aside oh love how mean and despicable a passion must thou be when thy own pains can derive so much relief from those of another. Exuant. The street before Don Felix's house. Donna Anna and Elvira appear at the window. What, will you look out again? Oh, Elvira, my mind is distracted. In returning to the window, I meant only to renew my complaints at his absence. And yet, while I look out, I am conscious that, in spite of myself, I still retain a hope of seeing him. While I imagined he loved me, I little thought how far my affections were engaged to him. It was reserved for this fatal night, which has proved me to be the object of his scorn and derision, to make me sensible how absolute was his empire over my heart. Oh, why must this falsehood thus augment my love? While by confessing that love, I have but taught him to forget me. Be not surprised at hearing me talk thus, Elvira. No charm so strongly as neglect can inflame the passions of the human heart. You have indeed, madam, sufficient reason to complain, yet you had so repeatedly protested you would return no more to the window. I could no longer restrain myself. Oh, fool that I was, to write him that letter. Could I have supposed him capable of this, I should have been more guarded in my expressions. I should not so plainly have acknowledged my love. It is now too late to retract it. Yet indeed, what woman was ever discreet, when once she had allowed herself to take pen in her hand? But now, madam, supposing he should at this very moment make his appearance, how would you accost him? I think you would be at a loss to determine whether you should express most anger or tenderness. Oh, I can hardly answer you, Elvira. Is there not, after all, a possibility that he may have been detained against his will, to write dispatches, perhaps, or execute some necessary business for the prince? Methinks you are very ready to find excuses for him. Anything to afford myself relief. Those who are so very ingenious in pleading for a criminal plainly show... What is it they show? That they are more than half inclined to pardon him ah elvira love is a very silly thing if he should indeed come now and try to exculpate himself though i knew to a certainty that every syllable he uttered was false i feel that i should still hear him with pleasure and voluntarily suffer myself to be deceived ah oh, would to heaven he were here thus to deceive me enter don caesar and lazaro what can bring you this way now sir in such a hurry don't you see that it is already morning i go lazaro to seek my death where lately life awaited me i know all hope is at an end yet since the prince has at last returned to the palace i cannot resist the wish which leads you on methinks with no very slow pace 
to see if anybody is still remaining at the window i protest there is somebody i spy a woman one woman did i say nay now i spy two how may i venture to present myself ah me unhappy do you lazaro approach the window and if it is my love tell me whether she looks displeased and how do you expect me to venture if you come to that any more than yourself i dare say elvira is as angry as her mistress is it you donna anna it is indeed don caesar the credulous fool who sat here long in expectation of you unsuspicious of the truth which is now but too manifest but i thank you for undeceiving me and i am sufficiently punished for my rashness in writing to you as i did by the remorse which my fault now occasions me do you come hither by daylight in truth i should have supposed that the darkness of the night would have been better suited to your treasons you pursued me with your dissembling love only till you supposed yourself secure of my favour and then you showed me plainly that you had courted it only to slight it but you presumed too soon don caesar you ought to have kept your assignation to discover what were my intentions in granting it to you nor can you boast of my madness in having offered you such an opportunity without proclaiming your own folly in losing it you may now go and learn to treat ladies for the future with more civility and when you have taken a few lessons of good manners you may return to offer your services to me retires from the window after you have thus cruelly reproached me for my seeming fault will you not dine donna anna to listen to my justification yet if you refuse to hear me to the winds let me declare my innocence and call love himself to witness how much i have suffered this night while unavoidably compelled to be absent from you not through any neglect of my own have i lost the opportunity of seeing you but through the tyranny of fortune who deemed me perhaps unworthy of such felicity yet rather than allow yourself to feel any regret for the favour you had shown me let me dearest anna continue the object of your anger reproach me hate me but blame not your own heart if for a moment it was moved to any pity for my sufferings the prince has detained me this whole night and obliged me to accompany him round the city nor could any of the excuses i urged prevail on him to dispense with my attendance your brother was with us and can confirm to you the truth of all i say ask him lovely anna and convince yourself of my innocence beyond the possibility of doubt and if you have withdrawn your affection from me at least do not add to my affliction by suspecting my fidelity be assured that however unhappy you may render me i shall ever continue to love you and to adore you nor can your utmost severity have power to change my heart donna anna returning to the window and is this true on my soul it is could you ever seriously believe me faithless and why not if you could seriously accuse me of withdrawing my affection from you how could you suppose that heart capable of change which has declared itself yours for ever but already i see the first beams of the sun gild the top of yon distant hills i must not be seen here talking with you retire for the present don caesar and leave it to me to contrive some other opportunity for our meeting only take care you do not lose it like the last if you compassionate my sufferings i glory in them no more delays but away quickly adieu my most precious treasure my every good wish attends you yet one word more mm, what would you say i would only ask if you are still very angry with me you shall see how angry i am when we meet again then till that time adieu my offended love adieu my faithless my dearest caesar exit don caesar and donna anna retires from the window and what is your ladyship to say to me have not you a little gentle anger in store for me i angry and pray what should i be angry about because your mistress is angry to be sure don't you see that i am in love to be like my master i really never knew so much till this very moment oh yes when i see my master merry i always laugh 
when he is sad i fold my arms thus and look dismal when he sighs for the mistress i woo the maid you shall see me jealous if he entertains any fears of a rival and if he meets with ill usage i shall consider it as an affront offered to myself when he is amorous i am tender when he is disdainful i am contemptuous and as my love is the very shadow of his so on the day which restores him to freedom i shall also shake off my chains huh. so this is what i have to expect from you exactly and now to begin since our master and mistress have been quarrelling let us have a pretty little scolding match of our own why what have you and i to scold about never mind what only let us scold and the occasion may come at leisure now do you hide yourself like donna anna and i will stand here like don caesar and call you back to the window but how if i won't come and how if i don't call you excellent the palace into the prince and don felix your highness looks melancholy you mistake i am only occupied with public business aside to how many troubles do we often expose ourselves in trying to escape from one oh that the loss of hope might avail to deliver the heart from love enter on the other side don larius don caesar and lazaro thus was i at last so fortunate as to appease her hold yonder are the prince and don felix he is not worthy of good fortune who does not improve a favourable opportunity here lazaro i have been writing to donna anna to repeat my excuses to her and to entreat her to hasten the interview she has promised me take the letter and see if you can contrive to deliver it to elvira you may easily do it now you see don felix is out of my way oh yes sir that you may depend upon i'll carry it directly for i shall be sure of admittance to the ladies of the family while the master of the house is abroad exit look sir yonder come don caesar and don arius i see them aside and i have overheard a few words of their discourse which my imagination can interpret various ways gentlemen you seem in deep conference what may be the subject of it don caesar sir was telling me a story i caught a few words of it sufficient to excite my curiosity relate it to me don caesar don caesar aside what shall i say now it was quite a trifle sir not worth your highness's attention i assure you nothing that can make me melancholy for i was never merrier than now if the story was such a trifle you can have no reason for refusing to let me hear it sir don arius tells a story much better than i do desire him to repeat it to you for he is as well acquainted with it as myself aside i hope his invention may be a little readier than mine don arius aside to don caesar why would you throw it upon me what must i say don caesar aside to don arius say anything provided you do not mention my affair don arius aside to don caesar you may trust me i'll bring you off in a moment while don arius is speaking with the prince don caesar walks aside discoursing with don felix well don arius how stands the business at present sir he saw her after he parted from your highness and found her much offended at his delay but at last he justified himself and obtained stronger assurances of her love than ever he has now taken advantage of finding don felix engaged with you to send her a letter and he expects that her answer will contain a new assignation how long is it since he sent it you might have seen him dispatch lazaro with it as we entered this apartment prince aside she must not receive it 
I cannot bear that this intercourse should continue between them, nor suffer the promised meeting to take place. Heavens, is this mean passion, jealousy, a fit inmate for a breast like mine? Yet do I find its impulse irresistible to Don Caesar. So, Don Caesar, is this what has passed? Your Highness may rely upon the truth of what Don Arius has told you. I am sorry, Don Felix, to occasion you uneasiness, but really I think it wrong to conceal from you that I have just heard your sister is very ill, seized suddenly with a fainting fit. My sister fainting? So I have been informed. This alarms me greatly. I should have been unwilling to communicate such ill news to you, but on the consideration that perhaps your presence may be necessary at home. With your highness's leave, I will hasten thither and inform myself farther. Exit. Prince aside. The very thing I meant you should do, that your return may hinder her writing. Don Caesar aside. Alas, what will become of my letter? Prince aside. And if Don Felix comes back to tell me that he found his sister in perfect health, I have only to say I had mistaken the name, and he will be satisfied at once. Exit. What does this mean, Don Arius? Is this unlucky circumstance of your invention? Nay, you would not blame me if you knew what an ingenious tale I had composed for your service. I was obliged to say something of Dona Anna, because the prince told me he had heard you mention her name as you entered the room, so I brought him in this fainting fit by the head and shoulders. But he will find Lazaro with Donna Anna. What can be done? Oh, don't alarm yourself about that. Felix will reach his own house before Lazaro and get halfway there, for the fright into which the prince has thrown him will add wings to his feet. I think no man was ever so unfortunate as I. Here is another opportunity lost. Whenever I promise myself the greatest pleasure, I am certain to experience the severest disappointment. Excellent. Don Felix's house. Enter Donna Anna with a letter in her hand and Elvira. Well, madam, have you finished your letter? I have filled my paper, yet I can hardly affirm I have finished my letter, for it does not contain half of what I meant to say. When I sat down to write... I was so wholly occupied with my subject that I laid my paper across and dipped the wrong end of my pen in the ink. Instead of a word, therefore, my letter begins with this great blot, for I would not take another sheet, because this seemed a better representation than any language can afford of sentiments so confused as mine. The more I had to say to him, the greater loss I was at for expressions. My heart indeed was like a narrow-mouthed bottle, which, if filled too full, will not pour out a drop, but as the water, when once it has forced its passage from such a vessel, gushes out in a stream, so my ideas after the two first lines flowed so rapidly that I could scarcely limit them within this scanty compass. The sum of what I have told him is that to afford him a more safe and private opportunity of visiting me, I will go to spend the day at my brother's villa in the country, but you may read the letter if you have any inclination. Enter Don Felix. Take care, madam. Hide away the paper. Donna Anna, starting. Mercy upon me. Ah, sister, your paleness and trembling but too strongly confirm my fears. It is plain I have not been misinformed. What has been the matter? Uh, nothing, brother. Nay, do not attempt to deceive me, for I have heard it all. Why would you deny it? Do you suppose I should have returned home so much earlier than I had intended, if I had not been seriously alarmed on your account? Indeed, brother. I have never wronged you, nor have you any just cause to be offended with my love. I am at a loss to comprehend you, sister, if you seek thus to dissemble with me, through a fear of occasioning me uneasiness, your agitation counteracts the attempts, and I read the truth in your countenance. Why will you not own it at once? It is impossible you can accuse me of having made an unworthy choice. She is certainly still light-headed. She could never otherwise return me answers so little to the purpose. Dona Anna aside to Alvira. 
What can I do, Elvira? Elvira sighed to Donna Anna. Never be so silly as to confess. Deny everything, at least till you know whether he has any good grounds for his suspicions. Elvira, do you satisfy me what is the matter with your mistress? Alas, sir, she has been very ill. She was seized with a kind of fit, and lay for dead I know not how long. She is hardly quite come to herself yet. Yet see how pale she looks, and how difficult she fetches her breath. Ay, this is exactly what I was told. I'll assure you, sir, I never thought we should have been able to bring her to life again. And yet, ill as she was, she would not let me send for you, and charge me not to tell you that anything had been the matter with her, for fear you should make yourself uneasy. It was unkind, my dear sister, to attempt to conceal your sufferers from me, because to a friendship like mine it affords no inconsiderable satisfaction to share them with you. But what could you mean by telling me that you had never wronged me, and that you had not made an unworthy choice? The more sensible I am of your friendship, brother, the stronger is my wish to avoid giving you any subject of uneasiness, i therefore surely did not wrong you in not encroaching so far upon your kindness as to occasion you unnecessary pain nor did i think i made an unworthy choice in determining from that motive to conceal from you my illness but what was the cause of such a sudden seizure sister you were never subject to fits of that kind donna anna aside he questions me very closely but my panic is over now and i am a match for him as I was sitting carelessly in my own room, I heard a violent noise in the street. I was a little startled and ran to the window, and there I saw, just before our door, a number of men, all with their swords drawn against one. That one my terrified imagination mistook for you. Fear, you know, misrepresents every object, and the idea of your danger instantly deprived me of my senses and threw me into that swoon of which elvira has told you now you see sir since this was the real truth of the matter my mistress could have had no reason to wish to conceal her illness except her unwillingness to give you uneasiness and how do you find yourself now oh much better and tolerably composed again <laughs> enter lazaro i have had no great trouble in gaining admission at least for there were the doors wide open and not a servant in the way so i have even walked in without asking leave of anybody because starts on seeing don felix hey lazaro what brings you here and what has frightened you so lazaro trembling because um because of what Lazaro aside. To be sure, it must be his ghost. Did I not leave him at the palace not five minutes ago? Donna Anna aside. Certainly everything conspires to betray me. Lazaro aside. I must invent some story now to bring myself off. Thank the stars, if a man has but his wits about him, he may find a way out of every danger. The villain, the scoundrel! Calm yourself, and let me hear what has happened to you. I cannot calm myself, sir, I cannot indeed. I am too angry. If I did not vent my passions, it would burst me however as to the matter of what has happened the best i can tell you sir is this i chance to be at a gaming table sir for sir i do play as well as the best of them i and stake my whole estate upon a single throw of the dice so sir as it chanced a very villainous chance befell me for by chance in came aside where the devil would my story end as i was saying sir there chanced to come in a man nay why should i call him a man he is no better than the shadow of a man and the very sight of a man might be sufficient to annihilate him 
Now what does this fellow do but picks a quarrel with me? Not that he durst meet me, no, nor look at me alone. But he has brought with him eleven fellows more that he might fall upon me with odds. So when I saw the round dozen of them all coming to attack me at once, with their swords drawn, I whipped out the blade that I was given me last night by the prince, heaven bless his honour, to make my story short, I showed them plain enough what it was they had to deal with, for I drove them all out into the street, and there I laid among them, cutting here and slashing there, till at last they were ashamed of being so beaten, and twelve of them assailed me on one side, and nine on the other, and the remaining three made a stand against me in front. Well, but twelve and nine and three make four and twenty. I thought there had been but a dozen of them. Very true, sir, but then I reckon they're shadows and all. However, I was more than a match for the whole posse of them, and if I had not unluckily broken my sword, I should have sent every one to the devil. Broken your sword? Why, don't I see it whole by your side? Why, sir, as whole as a roach. Why, that was the most extraordinary circumstance of all. You must know that when I broke my sword, I did not give up the battle for all that, but using the point of it, as if it had been my dagger, which I had lost just before, I gave such a furious blow to one man's steel buckler that it struck fire. So the very instant I saw the spark fly out, as quick as thought I joined the pieces of my sword to one another and soldered them together in the flame very extraordinary indeed but you say you lost your dagger how happens it then that i see it sticking in your girdle oh sir such a common accident as that is hardly worth telling you i stabbed one of the rascals and he ran away with a dagger in his side however not being much hurt he presently drew it out and came back to attack me with my own weapon now as good luck would have it i happened at that very moment to turn myself round thus so that the point of it went directly into its own sheath and there it has stayed ever since i suppose the battle would have lasted till now if madam justice had not interposed and parted us and it was to get out of her clutches that i ran in hither i think your fright must have taken away your senses for certainly i never heard any man utter so many absurdities i dare say brother this must have been the very fight that i was telling you i saw and pray sister was lazaro the gentleman whom you did me the honour to mistake for me ah uh, i'm sure i don't know who it was only i thought i saw somebody richly dressed it might possibly have been his master i hope sir since my danger was so pressing you will excuse my having sought protection under your roof the more i think of it the more probable it seems to me that caesar himself has been engaged in some quarrel and that his servant having orders to conceal it has invented all these lies to excuse himself from telling the truth i will look out sister and see whether the street be quiet Exit. Here's a fine opportunity, madam, to deliver your letter. I have much to say to you, Lazaro, but I will not waste time at present. Here is a note for Don Caesar. And here's another in exchange for it. You see, my master does not remain long in debt. Tell him to be sure not to disappoint me this time. By the by, Lazaro, your story suited admirably well with one I had been telling my brother just before you came in. It will do still better if you can drop some hint to confirm his notion that your master may have been a party concerned in it. Take care what you say. Enter Don Felix. The street is perfectly quiet. I hear nothing stirring in it. If the street be quiet, it is more than I am. I must go seek my master. Mercy upon me, if he should have received any wound. How? Was Don Caesar then engaged in this conflict? You ask me more, madam, than I am at liberty to declare. I must beg leave to be excused from saying anything as to that matter. Exit. 
He could not have told us more plainly that his master was concerned in it. Oh, my illness has left a strange oppression on my spirits. Then let me entreat you to go this evening to my country house. The change of scene will revive you and do you more good than anything. I am always ready, brother, to comply with your wishes. Excellent. The Palace. Enter Don Arias, Don Caesar, and Lazaro. I assure you, sir, I had enough to do to bring myself out of the scrape. Don't talk to me till I have read my letter. I shall have time enough afterwards to listen to your story. Well, but, Lazaro, I am at leisure. Let me hear how you manage matters. Admirably, you may be certain, when you see me here alive to tell the tale. Don Arius, if you have any wish to know the contents of my letter, you may as well read it with me, and save me the trouble of showing it to you afterwards. Don Arius reads the letter over Don Caesar's shoulder. Lazaro aside. I can't think how my master can place so much confidence in that babbler without ever considering that it must have been he that told the prince about my wooden sword i'll be hanged if he does not betray him for when a man is so anxious to know things that don't concern himself it can only be for the pleasure of telling them again she writes well oh incomparably so much affection expressed with so much delicacy yes her complaints of your failure last night are very prettily turned so then she expects you at her villa this very evening she does and till i shall be with her every instant will appear an hour and every hour an age hold for neither his age nor this hour nor this instance are proper for the oration you are just now in the queue to make the prince pointing to the door i am sorry he has seen me why so because I am afraid he may again command my attendance and hinder my going to Donna Anna. You have indeed some grounds for the apprehension. Enter the prince. Prince aside. I wanted to ask Don Arias what ensued from my sending Don Felix home this morning, but I see Don Caesar with him. I must find some pretense to send one away, that I may discourse with the other at liberty. I have the honor to salute your highness. Well, gentlemen, what is the subject of your conversation now? Nothing particular, sir. Don Caesar aside to Don Arius. If he insists on your telling him, for heaven's sakes, mind what you say. Don't let us have any more fainting fits. Caesar, here are some papers which ought to have been dispatched yesterday. Lazaro aside. Did I not say that some mischief would come of loitering here to tell secrets? Go and look them over, and dispose of them properly. I shall, sir. Aside. This is a lucky escape. When I have once got out of his sight, I may defy Fortune herself to disappoint me of my hopes a second time. Excellent Don Caesar and Lazaro. I have dismissed him, Don Arius, to obtain an opportunity of hearing from you what passed at don felix's house sir i have not yet had time to learn all the particulars i only know that though felix found lazaro with his sister the knave had the address notwithstanding to deliver his master's letter and to bring away an answer and have you seen the answer i have what does it contain a new assignation prince aside how cruel is the passion which thus impels me to seek to discover things of which the knowledge is fatal to me where does she appoint him to visit her and at what time this evening at her brother's villa in the country how can i hinder this meeting when i have myself dismissed him and given him the opportunity to hasten thither what can i do don arius repair to the villa yourself sir you may easily assign some plausible pretext for your visit and if you spend the whole evening there you will effectually prevent any private interview between the lovers 
That, indeed, would be easy enough, but it would ill become me to interpose personally in such an affair. I must have recourse to some more subtle expedient. Here comes Don Felix. Then do you leave me. I would talk with him alone. Exit Don Arias. Enter Don Felix. Don Felix, you are come most opportunely. Is there anything in which your highness can command my services? There is an affair, Don Felix, in which I particularly wish to employ you. You must know that Caesar has received a very serious affront. I need not tell you how much I interest myself in his concerns. Sir, I am already acquainted with the insult which has been offered to Don Caesar. Prince aside. This man was always a flatterer. Can there be anything more ridiculous than his pretending to know a circumstance which has never happened? Well, sir, since you are so accurately informed on this subject, you cannot be ignorant that Caesar is exposed to great personal danger. That is very evident. After the assault which has been made on him and his servant by a dozen armed men. Prince aside. Well said. A fertile invention. I shall presently have him telling me the time, place, and occasion of this combat, with the names of all the parties concerned it. I have just learnt, Don Felix, that he has received a challenge, appointing him to a meeting in a field close by your country house, and that, hearing his adversary meant to repair thither alone, he, from a point of honour, has set out unattended. But I much fear that some foul play has intended him, and I should have insisted upon accompanying him in person, had I not feared that some impetuation might be cast upon the courage of a man who brought a second of my rank into the field. I rather wish, therefore, to commit the care of his safety to you. And what would your highness wish me to do? Nothing more, Felix, than to seek for him, and when you have overtaken him, keep him in your sight all the remainder of the evening, but do not tell him your motive for staying with him, nor give him any reason to suppose you are acquainted with his secret. And above all things, take care he does not suspect that it was I who sent you after him. I shall be happy to have such an opportunity of showing my zeal in your highness's service. Exit. And I shall be glad to try, by such an experiment, whether love himself may not be baffled by the superior power of jealousy. Exit. The street. Enter Don Caesar and Lazaro. I assure you, sir, I could not have hit on a better story to tell to Don Felix, for Donna Anna said it would exactly serve to confirm something she had invented about a quarrel in the street. I know not what, but she will explain it all to you. I can listen to nothing at this moment, Lazaro, for I am totally occupied by my fears of another disappointment and my impatience to reach the spot where Donna Anna expects me, that as I pass along my eyes distinguish no object, my ears catch no sound. Compared with my wishes, my utmost speed seems slow. Is this not Don Felix coming towards us? Enter Don Felix. The devil it is. Don Caesar, I am happy to have met with you. You are very obliging. Lazaro aside. A lucky encounter. Don Caesar aside. My fears were but too just. What brings you here? Nothing in particular. I strolled hither by chance. Which way are you going? I protest I know not myself, since I have had the good fortune to find you as much disengaged as I am. Let us take our walk together. An agreeable proposal. When I am not occupied by business, I cannot spend my time in any manner so much to my satisfaction as in enjoying the company of a friend. Don Caesar aside. Did ever a man endure a persecution like this? That would be a very pleasant way of spending the evening, to be sure, Don Felix. But I have an affair of consequence at present which calls me hence. I must therefore bid you adieu. Nay, since I have nothing else to do... I may as well walk with you, whichever way you go. But I have a house to call at, where I shall be detained a long time. With all my heart, 
I do not suppose that my being with you can prove any hindrance to you. But it is a great way off. So much the better. I am just in the humour for a long walk. Come, shall we be going? I cannot, I assure you. I must leave you, indeed, I must. You will seriously disoblige me if you will not suffer me to accompany you. I positively will not part with you thus. You shall not have the fatigue of going so far alone. I am resolved I will not quit you till night. Lazaro aside. Is this fellow a leech, that he sticks so closely? Don Caesar aside. This is too severe a trial of my patience. Pray, sir, what motive can you possibly have for thus honouring me? Don Caesar, I am your friend. Well, sir. Ay, sir, your faithful friend, and let it suffice that as such I have followed you, and as such I mean to remain with you. I must request a farther explanation. The subject will not admit of too close a discussion. Is it not enough to tell you that I have purposely sought you, with the design to attend you as your friend during the remaining part of the day? Do not affect to misunderstand me, Don Caesar, for you well know whither you are going, and in what affair you are engaged. Don Caesar aside. Heavens, where will this end? What affair, Don Felix? I insist on your declaring it. An affair of honour. Be not troubled, Don Caesar, that the provocation you have received should come to my knowledge. The provocation? I have received none, Don Felix. Into what strange mistake can you have fallen? How, Don Caesar, can you deny that you have this very day received a challenge, and that my villa is the spot appointed for the meeting? I have surely now said enough to convince you that I speak from correct information. I know also that there is a reason to apprehend some improper conduct on the part of your challenger, whose conduct has not been altogether clear from suspicion in your former transactions with each other, and it is my anxiety to prevent disagreeable consequences which determines me not to quit your side on this occasion. And where, I may ask, could you find a more proper attendant than myself? I have too much regard for my own honour to take any steps injurious to yours. I shall not interfere, unless I find it absolutely necessary. Nor can my presence, as a distant spectator, prove any impediment to an honourable termination of your affair." You may assure yourself, Don Caesar, I shall not let you proceed without me. Don Caesar aside. It is too plain he has discovered my assignation with his sister, and uses these ambiguous terms to express to me his apprehension for her honour. I will carry on his own fiction and endeavour to remove his fears. Lazaro aside. To be sure, he must have seen her give me the lesser... Don Felix, since I perceive you are so well informed, I will no longer dissemble with you. I esteem as I ought the favours you would confer on me, but suffer me to say that you do the greatest injustice to my challenger, if you suspect that a person of so much honour could be capable of any unworthy action. Had our meeting taken place, I can answer for my opponent with no less confidence than for myself, that no circumstance would have ensued injurious to the character of either but that I may calm your fears and convince you how sincerely it is my wish to terminate the affair in the most amicable manner. I am very willing to forgo the engagement I had formed, and to spend the evening in your company. I shall not be insensible of the advantage of permanently gaining a noble friend, and you are well aware that, among persons of our condition, all hostility ceases when the hand is offered as a pledge of amity. You give me infinite pleasure by this discourse, which affords me all the satisfaction I could wish. Don Caesar aside to Lazaro. Lazaro, fly secretly to Donna Anna, and tell her what has passed. Now, sir, I am ready to attend you. Excellent, Don Caesar and Don Felix. Yes, truly I shall go, and thank my stars that I at least may escape from this devil of a brother. I never saw such a brother. 
he comes as unseasonably as a piece of bad news and he's as difficult to shake off as a bad habit there is nothing bad to which one might not compare him and satan himself does not hook a poor sinner so firmly as he exit end of act two act three of keep your own secret by pedro calderon de la barca translated by henry richard vassal holland this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org act three a room in don felix's country house enter don caesar and lazaro already do i fancy myself in her arms and i can imagine madame elvira in mine my troubles at last are at an end take care they don't begin again when you least think of it no lazaro love and perseverance will at last vanquish every obstacle to-day i have kept out of the way of every possible hindrance i have neither seen the prince nor met with don felix nor spoken to anybody who could report which way i was going and at this moment i actually behold myself in her house ay here we are to be sure and a pretty good proof we afford how little is gained in this world by taking too many precautions those who fear danger abroad have generally the best chance to meet with it at home and donna anna is not the first lady who has received her gallant into her house out of a reverent fear lest her reputation should suffer if she spoke to him in the street i eagerly pressed her to consent to this measure because it seemed the only remedy against the persecutions of unjust fortune and at last i may surely think myself secure i have as you know spent all the day in concealment and i have got into the house unseen by any one what cross event can now happen to disappoint my hopes pray sir have you told donna arias of this assignation i have oh then you need to look no further for a cross event please to consider sir that if don felix did see me deliver the letter he could never have known a syllable of the contents of it unless somebody had told him and if that same mr somebody has any mind to disappoint you again to-night it signifies mighty little whether he saw you come here or not if he knew from yourself that you meant to come i name no names but take my word for it that man will not scruple telling anything who could tell the prince about my wooden sword don arius is a man of singular discretion of high nobility and my most confidential friend and this may suffice to entitle him to a participation of my most important concerns i am sure he is incapable of betraying my secret for he will guard it as the most sacred of treasures alas sir many a man before now has spent the treasures he was employed to guard and even those who are the most thrifty in money affairs are generally liberal enough with their friends secrets besides if you wanted to have yours kept why did not you keep it to yourself a pleasure is doubled when a friend partakes of it there's the very thing that alarms me i am afraid that your pleasure is not only doubled but tripled i multiplied a hundredfold by this time in proportion to the number of the people who partake of it with you but hark i hear someone at the door she comes now fortune i defy thee am i not in her house and if you are you are never a bit more secure for that you had best not holla till you are out of the wood enter elvira is it don caesar it is i i will go and secure the door then by which you entered my mistress is just coming exit 
now then i am about to receive the reward of all of my sufferings with what transport can i at this moment look back upon my past sighs my fears and my despair i consider them as the price of my present felicity enter donna anna you must undoubtedly don caesar think me very indiscreet to receive you thus enter elvira oh madam madam tis my master at the door what is it you tell me alas of how little avail against ill fortune are love and perseverance what can be done you must hide yourself don caesar but where go into that room he seldom enters it how vain is it for me to undertake anything when disappointment so certainly attends me excellent don caesar and lazaro enter don felix well sister how have you been employing yourself <clears throat> not in anything particular <laughs> but how is it i see you here at so unusual an hour i have no time for details but i am not come at such an hour without sufficient reason elvira order the coach to the door immediately and fetch your mistress's cloak exit elvira the coach at this time of night (laughs) whither would you carry me why you look as much frightened as if you thought i had some ill design upon you there is an entertainment at the palace this evening and the princess has sent me to fetch you thither so particularly is she disposed to honour you donna anna aside it is but too plain he knows it all and only speaks thus covertly that he may not too soon alarm me ah why am i doomed to suffer all the torments of disappointed love excellent enter don caesar and lazaro they are gone now but pray my good master about what are you sighing so heavily is it not enough i more than enough to satisfy you that you are in donna anna's house well you may thank your stars that you are likely at least this time to get off in a whole skin but beware of the next for you may be sure don felix knows well enough what is going forwards or he would never be coming across you as he is at every turning why can't you tell him at once that you intend to marry her that would bring you out of all your difficulties enter elvira you may depart safely now for they are gone and the coast is clear o oh, love o oh, fortune when will ye be weary of persecuting me exit well madam elvira and how stands our accounts i keep no accounts with anybody come now don't be perverse don't let you and me lose this opportunity you know we are bound to be in love with one another if it is only because we are the shadows of our betters nay if that is the case i must be off this very moment why so because my mistress is gone and you know a shadow can never stay long behind its substance Exit. and so here i am left to play out my game by myself that is but dull sport methinks i'll e'en go and seek better company exit the palace enter the prince and don arius the festival was indeed magnificent could not the sight of so much beauty and splendour sir a little dissipate your melancholy it rather don arius increased it in every look and gesture of donna anna i read her love for don caesar and her regret at the disappointment which i had occasioned to the both had any other man been my rival i scarcely know to what extremities jealousy might have transported me but i cannot hate caesar though even last night when he thought himself so unfortunate he appeared in my eyes as an object of envy. 
but what end do you propose to yourself by thus obstructing his happiness i know not don arius my own ruin i believe so fatal to my peace is the cruel secret which your imprudence has confided to me i am most sensible of my error yet it is your own command which obliges me to continue in it yonder comes don cesar i will retire into the closet where if you question him i shall be able to hear from his own mouth the present state of his mind retires enter don caesar did ever man experience so many vexatious accidents as myself what is the matter now don caesar my usual ill luck fortune never appears to smile upon me but when she is preparing me for some new disappointment i went to donna anna at the hour she had appointed and scarcely was i admitted when her brother came and carried her away with him to the palace it is plain enough that he must by some means have discovered the whole affair probably he even knew me to be at that moment concealed in his house and indeed his very handsome conduct has laid me under so strong an obligation to him that i have determined to deal openly with him and immediately demand of him his sister's hand and do you think he will accept your proposal he cannot i am persuaded object to the alliance and i have no doubt but that it will also meet with the prince's approbation but do not detain me for i am impatient to bring my fate to the decision exit re-enter the prince well sir have you heard his determination don felix certainly cannot deny his sister to him i could not refuse him my own if he should ask her of me muses enter don felix ah don felix you are come at the very moment when i was wishing for you i have been for some time desirous to give you a proof of the esteem i entertain for you and i think i cannot do it more effectually than by relieving your mind from what must undoubtedly be one of its most important cares and providing an eligible establishment for your sister aside don caesar shall find that his suit comes too late a near connection of my own aspires to the hand of donna anna and i am persuaded that you will readily agree to a marriage which has the sanction of your prince so great an honour exceeds my utmost deserts permit me to kiss your highness's feet in token of my acknowledgment i have been informed by letters of the sentiments of my friend and i have assured him that he may consider the affair as entirely concluded from this moment therefore i take the conduct of it upon myself only i recommend it to you don felix for some time to observe secrecy on the subject i would not as yet have it publicly divulged however you will of course acquaint your sister and reject any other suitors who may offer themselves your highness may implicitly rely on my obedience and devotion to your service i know not how to express my gratitude for such unmerited favours otherwise than by the most fervent prayers for your welfare and preservation prince aside such is the vain end of all my idle hopes exit i will hasten to communicate the news to my sister i shall certainly afford her infinite satisfaction by announcing to her the prospect of an alliance so noble excellent don felix's house enter donna anna and elvira you look very melancholy and have i not reason elvira a few more such disappointments will certainly kill me indeed i wonder i have survived my ill fortune so long however if i was spitefully inclined i might most amply revenge myself on my brother he has made me the confidant of his passion for the princess and has even employed me to solicit her on his behalf if he were really as much enamoured as he imagines himself he would never have committed that office to another his own eyes might plead to her in a language more forcible and more expressive but that is his affair i wish him well and will stand his friend as far as i can and if there be little love at first on either side 
Perhaps more may appear afterwards when I fan the flame. Exit Elvira. Enter Don Felix. Oh, sister, if you have but as good news for me as I think you must allow I bring to you, I shall consider myself as the happiest man alive. An alliance for you has been proposed to me which will reflect the highest honour on yourself and on your family. I could not hesitate an instant to accept it, and I have accordingly disposed of your hand. May I rely on your acquiescence? Dona Anna aside. Oh, it must certainly be Caesar who has asked me of him. Oh, happy day! Oh, fortunate woman that I am! <clears throat> you may at all times, brother, assure yourself of my obedience. You have ever supplied to me the place of a father. As such, I respect you, and am implicitly devoted to your will. My dear sister, your answer charms me, and I am happy to perceive by your countenance that your compliance with my proposal is not contrary to your own inclinations. But, if you are pleased with my news, have you none to give me? I took an opportunity this very morning to acquaint the princess with your passion, and I drew no unfavourable inferences from the manner in which she listened to me. And what did she say? She said nothing. And on that very circumstance do I found my hopes. If she had been displeased with what I told her, she would not have suffered me to go on upon the subject without interrupting me. Take my word for it. A woman is more than half engaged who has once listened with patience to a lover's suit, and in such a case, silence is the most favourable answer she can return. Only persevere in your courtship, and never trust me more if you do not carry your point. You transport me, sister, by this assurance. Yet how could I doubt of success in a cause in which I had employed so excellent an advocate? Enter Elvira. Sir, Don Caesar is below, and desires permission to speak with you. You then, sister, will retire. Donna Anna aside. He has undoubtedly come to conclude the whole affair. I may now consider my happiness as certain. I long to hear what he will say. I must positively stay at the door and listen. Donna Anna and Elvira retire. Enter Don Caesar. You do not treat me well, Don Caesar. Why do you use any ceremony at a house which I should wish you to enter as freely as if it were your own? Dona Anna listening and aside. It is plain he receives him like a brother already. I could not take the liberty, Don Felix, to visit you without requesting your permission. Although I am too nearly interested in the business which brings me hither to make any unnecessary delays. You are not unacquainted with the nobleness of my family, with the estate which I possess nor with the unblemished character which I have hitherto maintained in the world. You know, likewise, how high it is my happiness to stand in the prince's favour, which might have sufficed to ennoble me had I been born to a meaner fortune. From my earliest years I have had the honour to enjoy the principal share in his confidence, and have been entrusted by him with the conduct of the most important affairs. But that I may not too much trespass on your attention, I will enlarge no further on my situation and circumstances but only tell you in a few words that I value your friendship as one of the highest advantages I possess, and wish to confirm it by the strongest ties. Dona Anna aside. Hm, I suppose that the affair has only been yet proposed in general terms, and they now meet to arrange particulars. You must certainly by this time be aware of my aim in thus addressing you, since you cannot forget what a treasure you have at your disposal. I am ready to confess that— Though I were sovereign of the world, I should still be unworthy to raise my hopes to such a height. But if I am guilty of presumption, at least it is a presumption of a pardonable nature. And since you would vainly seek a man whose merits should suffice to entitle him to your sister's hand, allow me to tell you that it has long been the object to which my most ardent wishes have aspired, and that, if you think my rank and fortune such as are not beneath the alliance I solicit— you will render me the happiest of men by sanctioning my addresses to Donna Anna. Donna Anna aside. If I did not so positively know that he had already obtained my brother's consent, I should suppose that he was now asking it for the first time. 
"'You seem lost in thought, Don Felix. "'Do you hesitate what answer to return me?' "'It is not without reason, Don Caesar, "'that I feel myself at a loss how to reply to your proposal. "'Had you made it but one hour sooner, "'Donna Anna had been yours. "'For were my choice free, "'there is no man to whom I would give her hand so readily as to yourself. "'But I am most sincerely grieved.' to tell you that it is within that time that I have contracted her to another, nor am I at liberty as yet to explain myself any further. Donna Anna aside. Alas, what do I hear? If you speak thus, Don Felix, to punish me for not having sooner declared to you my attachment to your sister, you may rest assured that the sufferings which that delay has occasioned me have already sufficiently avenged you. I have now offered you an opportunity to remedy past offences, nor ought you to reject it when you consider all those circumstances with which I know you are acquainted. I am undoubtedly acquainted with all the circumstances of your fortune and family, which would concur to render your alliance highly eligible and advantageous, but I am totally at a loss, Don Caesar, to comprehend what you can mean by speaking of past offences, for I know of none of which I have ever been guilty towards you. If I have at any time unintentionally wronged you, inform me in what manner, and I am ready instantly to offer you satisfaction. Upon my honour I have promised my sister's hand, and I wish I might tell you to whom. Nay, it was but the moment before you came in that I had acquainted her with the engagement I had formed for her, and she, who is always ready to comply with my wishes, most cheerfully expressed her satisfaction at the proposal. Donna Anna aside to Elvira. Elvira, this is too much. I must speak with Caesar, be the hazard what it may. Don Caesar aside. Donna Anna, cheerful and satisfied at being disposed of to another. And do I survive the news? Patience, patience, heaven. Don Felix, you are now indeed revenged on me and if I presumed too far when I raised my hopes so high, you have blasted those hopes and may be satisfied. Since I have not been so fortunate as to deserve the hand of Donna Anna, and since she is herself so well contented to bestow it on another, may she live happily with him whom she has chosen, and may the years which are taken from my life be added to theirs. Elvira aside to Donna Anna. Methinks he consoles himself very easily. He is not consoled, Elvira. I know him better. I tell you, I must speak with him instantly. Well, if you must, I will try if I cannot make an opportunity for you. Enters the room. Sir, there is a man at the door who desires to speak with you. Excuse me for a moment, Don Caesar, till I have inquired his business. I will return to you immediately. Exit. Fate, thou hast done thy worst. It is impossible thou canst now have any further ills in store for me. Enter Donna Anna. Oh, Caesar, what have I heard? You have heard the sentence of my death. Let me eagerly snatch this moment to assure you that it is impossible that I should ever forget the affection. Don Felix without. I can find nobody. Here he is coming back again. Am I denied even the satisfaction of expressing my woes? Retires. Enter Don Felix. It is strange that any body should come to inquire for me and run away without delivering his message. I went even out into the street to look for him. Perhaps he may return by and by. Don Felix, how cruel soever my destiny may be, I still think myself indebted to it, since it has afforded me the satisfaction of being so speedily undeceived on the point the most essential to my peace. Since your charming sister is indeed disposed of, I pray to heaven to render her as happy in her choice as I myself could have wished to be in mine. But notwithstanding what has passed, Don Caesar, let me entreat you to entertain no doubt of my esteem for you, and not to let the subject of this evening's conversation prove any interruption to our friendship. By no means. My regard for you shall always continue undiminished. Excellent. The palace. Enter Lazaro. 
don caesar has sent me to look for don felix because he wants to speak with him in all haste and trouble enough the search has cost me for i can't find him in the whole city and now i have lost my master too i believe they will drive me mad among them and yet truly if they do they will have no such wonderful feet to boast of either but here comes the prince enter the prince what lazaro here ay sir for want of a better how goes it with you now it goes pretty much as it went and please your highness is there anything new i vow sir you put me in mind of a boy that i once saw mending his stockings and i asked him your highness very question is there anything new quoth i nothing but my thread quoth he however i can't take upon me to say so much as that for i can't boast that i have even a thread new about me had i nothing more serious on my mind it would amuse me to listen to thy jests exit there he goes now as melancholy as a cat but such is the course of this world the rich weep and the poor laugh and so laughing and crying on they trudge to their graves enter don caesar i waited till i saw the prince had left you lazaro to tell you that the crisis of my fate is at last arrived i have been with don felix but he had already promised his sister to another who it is i cannot discover however from this apparent misfortune my highest felicity will result for she has sent elvira to follow me and to appoint me on this very night to steal her away and make her mine for ever why then sir as you value the happiness you hope for pray don't let don arias know anything of this what passion can you possibly have for telling him all your secrets does not the whole future good or evil of your life depend upon the issue of this affair most unquestionably then what harm can it do you to keep the business for a few hours to yourself or what advantage could you gain by publishing it well that you may not have it to say that i am above taking advice and that i may afford myself a fair opportunity to judge how far your suspicions are just i will for this once retain my secret in my own bosom then now may your hopes soar above the moon for from this moment i consider as certain your triumph over every obstacle but now sir do not knit your brow in that manner to let people see that your brains are at work on some project of importance but look cheerful have something to say to everybody you meet and as soon as the sun is down and the clouds have put on their mourning for his loss we will away and set about this mighty enterprise enter don arius don caesar he has no news to tell you sir so that you may save yourself the trouble of asking how is it with you my friend if he does look a little gloomy or so sir it is not because of any quarrel he has got upon his hands he's not going to fight a duel sir you need not follow him to be his second how stands your affair with dona anna alas the hope which i so long had cultivated is blasted ere it has rendered me its promised fruit i asked her hand of don felix he told me that my application came too late since already by her own consent he had disposed of it to another she is married and pleased with her lot can jealousy inflict severer torments 
now pray sir be satisfied with what my master has told you and don't make him say any more for he is very ill of the headache and there is nothing so bad for it as talking what can i do to serve you you can't serve him so much anyway sir as by holding your tongue if that is the case i will leave you but i assure you i feel very sensibly for your misfortune exit Aye. i believe indeed you are sorry that it is out of your power to do him any more mischief oh love if ever thou wert moved to pity let my situation now incline thee to favour me may my past suffering suffice to satisfy their rigour and may this night recompense me for all that i have hitherto endured into the prince and donarius so this is what he has told you yes sir and i see he is still here methinks it will be proper to employ him in some business to-night lest it should ever occur to him that i might have had any motive for detaining him only when he had made assignations with his mistress caesar sir i shall want you to stay with me to-night and write letters you know it is monday and i have dispatches to send to rome and to naples which it will take you till morning to prepare very well sir aside how every chance of happiness eludes my grasp that it should be monday of all days in the week as if purposely for my ruin to lazaro now lazaro must my hope soar above the moon and is my triumph certain over every obstacle lazaro aside to don caesar alack a day sir what fault is this of mine you told me to stay here nay sir now pray don't blame me for it what business was it of yours to give me advice i am sure sir i meant it for the best that fortune should carry her spite against me so far as to make this day monday it would have been tuesday for anybody else to the prince sir i await your orders aside heaven grant i make no blunders my heart and soul are fixed on donna anna i shall not know a word i write a writing-table is brought forward and don caesar sits himself at it excellent don Aris and lazaro are you ready yes sir prince aside now shall it be seen whether my rival can endure the torments of jealousy with more fortitude than myself you must write a letter as i shall dictate now begin dictating i am don caesar writing i am aside dying with vexation secretly carrying on secretly carrying on the opportunity will be irrevocably lost your marriage treaty your marriage treaty no hope of it remains your wishes shall at last be gratified be gratified but not mine for all things combine to ruin me i can assure you can assure you i shall never survive this night that your honour is the only object of my aim the only object of my aim ought to be to abstract my thoughts from my misfortune but that is impossible since donna anna this is more than i can support writes is of the noble house of castelloy and is a prodigy of beauty and virtue where does your highness mean to send this letter to flanders this is not the day for the flemish dispatches so it may be left till to-morrow prince aside he changed colour at the name of donna anna no matter if it do not go to-night when it is written it will be ready to be sent at any time imagination itself could scarcely have devised a situation so agonising as mine why do not you go on writing let me hear with what words you left off don caesar reading i can support and when did i bid you write that let me see the letter takes it up i wrote as your highness dictated to me 
Prince reads. I am dying with vexation, secretly carrying on. The opportunity will be irrecoverably lost. Your marriage treaty, no hope of it remains. Your wishes shall at last be gratified, but not mine. I can assure you I shall never survive this night. Your honor is the only object of my aim, since Donna Anna is more than I can support. And pray, sir, did I dictate to you this eloquent composition? Oh, sir, if ever my faithful services have merited your favor, extend it to me now, while I open my whole heart to you, and humbly sue at your feet for pity and forgiveness. Donna Anna is my bride, not indeed as yet by the solemn rites of the church but by a vow interchanged between ourselves, which we would both die rather than consent to violate. During two long years I have constantly served her, and when at last she promised to reward my tedious sufferings by yourself, gracious prince, I have repeatedly been disappointed of my hopes, and I have sacrificed my own dearest interests rather than neglect the most trivial of your commands. Tonight she had agreed to fly with me, to escape the marriage to which an adverse fortune would have compelled her. To-night she was to have become irrevocably mine. In the fear lest any new obstacle to my wishes should arise, I kept this secret even from my most confidential friend, whose fidelity my former disappointments had led me in some measure to suspect. But no precautions can avail to secure a man so unfortunate as myself from the cruelty of his destiny nor have I any hope but the clemency of your highness, on which I throw myself for the decision of my fate. If you have so often, Don Caesar, experienced the malice of fortune, you have little reason to seek any other cause for your disappointments, and since your friend is plainly so innocent of what has befallen you to-night, you ought to discard any suspicions with which former circumstances may have inspired you, but enough of this. I must tell you, Don Caesar, that you have highly offended me by presuming to contract a marriage without informing yourself of my pleasure. Give me the pen. I will write myself, for I see how little I am to expect from your services. My services have indeed, sir, been most imperfect. Yet no man— I will not be interrupted. Writes. Don Caesar aside. Thus in one hour I am deprived of everything which I have hitherto thought valuable. My mistress and the favour of my prince are alike lost to me for ever. Can any greater torments be reserved for me? No. Fortune has done her worst. Take this letter and carry it to Don Felix. Let him obey the command which it contains. Is it to go immediately? Yes. I do not believe there is any messenger in waiting. I order you to carry it yourself. I shall employ my servants in what offices I choose. I have seen myself deprived of the only object of my love. I have beheld my sovereign incensed against me. My ruin is complete, and I have nothing further in this world to hope for. Exit. Enter Don Felix and Don Arius. Since Caesar is dismissed, I conclude the dispatches must be finished. Don Felix, it is reported that your intended brother-in-law will shortly arrive in Perina, and will visit you at your own house. I humbly thank your highness for such good news, as well in Donna Anna's name as in my own. With your leave, I will hasten to report it to my sister, that she may be properly prepared. Exit. Don Arias. What are your highness's commands? That you swear to me instantly upon the cross of my sword, never to reveal to Donna Anna that I have loved her, nor to Don Caesar that I have purposely obstructed his suit. I swear it. And may I now presume to ask of your highness that you will forbear to acquaint Don Caesar with my betrayal of his secret? I promise you I never will divulge it to him. And now come with me, and judge from my actions whether I am worthy of the illustrious name I bear. Excellent. Don Felix's house. Enter Don Felix, Dona Anna, and Elvira. It is true, I assure you. And is this the return you make to all my solicitude for your establishment? A vow of celibacy, indeed. 
I did not mention it at first, brother, because I did not believe you were in earnest. But now I find that you really have fixed so early a period for my marriage, I can no longer conceal from you that I am not at liberty to comply with your wishes. But what can I say to the prince? Donna Anna aside. Why does Caesar so long delay? But yonder, I see him, he comes, and I will brave every danger to escape with him. Enter Don Caesar and Lazaro. Don Caesar aside. For me alone it is reserved to be thus the messenger of my own destruction. Don Felix, if I have entered without previously demanding your permission, this letter will excuse me. It is addressed to you from the prince. I thank you for your trouble, Don Caesar. Don Caesar aside to Donna Anna. Ah, oh, my lost love. My only treasure. They talk apart. Don Felix reading to himself. Since a pleasure is always the greatest when it is least expected, I have hitherto concealed from you that the gentleman for whom I have solicited your alliance is your own friend, Don Caesar, in whom are so signally united all the qualities which you could desire in a brother. Bestow on him your sister's hand. He is worthy to possess her if indeed the deserts of any man living can suffice to entitle him to a prize so valuable. Why, Don Caesar, the prince writes to me that you are the person for whom he has demanded my sister. Heavens! What do I hear? Alas! How vain are all earthly projects of felicity! How happy would this intelligence have made me but an hour ago! but the proposal of such an alliance seems only made to enhance my regret at the circumstance which must prove an invincible bar to it donna anna has just informed me that she has vowed to assume a religious habit and therefore cannot marry anybody uh, it is true i said so is this possible does donna anna feign vows to afford herself a pretext for refusing her hand to me Read the prince's letter, however, Don Caesar. You cannot but be gratified to find how highly he speaks of you. Enter the prince and Don Arius. Do not waste time in reading my letter, Caesar, since here am I present to confirm whatever I have said of you. At your feet I thank you, sir, for your condescension in thus honouring my house. Don Caesar, it is thus I reward your faithful services, Give your hand to Donna Anna. I come purposely to be present at your nuptials. Oh, sister, what shall I say? Be not troubled, brother, for in a case of such urgency as the present, it is easy to obtain a dispensation from a vow. On my knees, loveliest Donna Anna. Kneels. Rise, Don Caesar. Aside to him. My vow will not be broken, for it extended no farther than that I would marry no other man but you. And so, sir, I see you are married at last. I thank the fates on your behalf, and yet if I may speak so much of my mind, I would rather it were you than I. I am now about to set out for Flanders, where the mighty Philip requires my services at Maastricht, that I may provide for the safety of my state during my absence, I appoint Don Felix to the government, and further to mark the regard I bear him, I give him my sister in marriage. I embrace your highness's knees in testimony of my grateful sense of the transcendent honours you confer upon me. Elvira? Well? I'm off. For now all the world is in this marrying mood. If I stay a moment longer, I'm afraid I shall get noosed myself. Let every man beware how he entrusts a secret even to the most prudent and faithful of his friends. For those who intend the best are liable to error, and he who cannot conceal a thing himself has little right to complain if another divulges it and with this moral we humbly take our leave of the audience entreating their pardon for all the faults 
which in the course of this evening we may have committed in their presence end of act three end of keep your own secret by pedro calderon de la barca translated by henry richard vassal holland